Well, good morning. Welcome to Sugarland Baptist Church. Happy New Year, everybody. Let's stand together and begin this year together with praise and worship to our Lord. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Join your voices. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone and our defense is sure. Oh God, you are, you are our help, you are our helper to all generations. You will be forever and ever our shield and our eternal And worthy of our praise. We serve the eternal God. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame. From everlasting thou art God to endless years the same. God our help. Oh God our help in ages past our hope for years to come. Be thou our guard while life shall last and our eternal you will be forever and ever our shield and our eternal hope. Oh Lord, you are the ancient of days and worthy of our praise. Oh God, you are, you are Amen. We do serve the eternal God. We've sung about that already, that he is our creator, that he sustains us. The scripture says, strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, the everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. 
strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not fade, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like you. Would you sing that again? Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Lift your voice. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the... Sing it out. Declare this our hope, our strong feeling. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not fade, you who won't grow weary. You're the Thank you. You may be seated. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we are so grateful for your presence among us today. We have turned the page of the calendar. We've entered a new year. But while we step into a place where we have never been before, we can have confidence. This is not a place that is unknown to you. That, Lord, you are beyond time. You are all-knowing. Uh, all you are omnipresent. Lord, there is nowhere our lives can take us where you are not already there. So we can trust in you. Lord, we know that in the beginning of a new year, we're often reminded of our heart's desire for a new start. We're so mindful of all the ways that we fail each and every year, and there is this hope in a new beginning, but Lord, we know that the true renewal, a true fresh start, comes not from the turning of a page on our calendar, but Lord, from you. You've promised us that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So Lord, we give you thanks today for the power of our salvation in Jesus Christ that no matter who we are or what we've done or where we've come from, in you, we can be made new. Lord, for this, we give you much praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 
We were, well, we're so glad that you've joined us for this New Year's Day worship service. Uh, we know we have a lot of guests that are still here today who've come in to visit family. Uh, maybe because of Southwest, you just didn't get to go home. And so uh, we just want you to know as long as you're stuck here, we're glad to have you. And uh, we're thrilled that you're with us today. You may be joining us online today. If you're a guest in either place, we, we would love to know that you're worshiping with us today. Here in the room, you'll find a connection card in the pew in front of you. you you can fill that out, and then later in our service, you can drop that in our offering plate uh, just to let us know that you were with us today. If you are worshiping with us online, you can text the word online to 281 916 8051, and you'll receive a digital version of that same card. You can also drop a comment in the comment section of whatever platform you happen to be worshiping with us on this morning. Uh, well, we are so glad that you're here because we've got a lot of guests and family. It's good. Let's take a couple of seconds to stand up and to greet one another in the name of the Lord. Another year is dawning, dear Father, let it be. In working or in waiting, another year with Thee. Another year of progress, another year of praise, another year of proving Thy presence all the day. Would you join with us singing the second stanza together? Another year of God's mercies. Join your voices. Another year of mercies, of faithfulness and grace. Another year of gladness, the shining of thy face. Another Now, we have never sung that, those words in our church before, but that is a text of great hope for a new year, and it calls us to live like Christ, not just in the past, but in the future as well. That song was written by a British hymn writer in the 19th century, and actually there's another uh, memento and milestone, rather, uh, of today, and that is 250 years ago, today, the song Amazing Grace was first sung in a congregation. Can you imagine that, what it would have been like to be in that place, in that church on that Sunday morning where John Newton presented that to the congregation and then all of the church together sang those words, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It's hard to imagine that 250 years ago. I woke up this morning feeling more hopeful for this new year than perhaps any other year over the last couple of years. I realized that there was a flaw in my thinking in that, that this year is not more hopeful because God's presence is the same today as it was yesterday, as it is forever. He is the God, our help, who helps us in ages past. He is our hope 
for years to come. He gives us amazing grace. His mercies are made new every morning, even this morning, this first day of the year. We wanna invite you to sing that song, that text that Christians have been singing for 250 years as of today, this morning. Let's sing that together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. God's people said, amen. amen. Congregation, please be seated. We're going to read God's word together. God calls us to put on the armor of God as we face this new year. We trust in the Lord that he goes before us, that he paves a way for us that may not be easy, but we know his presence is there. I'll read the slides that say leader. Together we'll read the slides that say congregation. This comes from the book of Ephesians chapter 6. It's the words of Paul. At the end of it, Paul asks for prayer for what his calling is. We're going to read that line together to know that we can pray for one another and what our calling is as Christians in this year. Let's read together. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, 
and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. We've been learning a new song in our church over the last month or so, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. It is sort of a Christmas song in the first verse, but as we continue singing it, it tells that whole gospel story of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Let's join our voices as we sing it. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man. In his living, in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hellbound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand. Let's stand together as we sing of the cross and his sacrifice for us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. Christ
Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. Father, thank you so much for what you have done to us and for us providing your son to save us of our sins. And we pray that you would help us to live in that resurrection power. This new day, this new day of 2023, we declare that age old truth that your mercies are made new every morning. Every day is a new day in you and through you. God, I pray that as we open your word, you might allow us to look to that, your word revealed to us, Christ, and the words written in the book that are for us and meant to guide us. We open ourselves to you, our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength. Let everything that we have live for you. Form that within us, O oh Lord, our God, our rock, our redeemer, our hope, our help, our ever-present Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I want you to remember that God, God's created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. Remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them and then he delivered their enemies to them and he unlocks wounds and he provides water from a rock and he provides manna from heaven and he brought down the walls of Jericho. He froze the sun allowing victory. He's toppled giants with tiny stones. He's brought fire from heaven. He shut the mouths of lions. He preserved life in the belly of a well. He's fed thousands with a few loaves. He gives the weak strength. He heals the sick. He's made the blind see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me by the death and the resurrection of the Son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. He controls everything. And he loves you. Amen. These last few years have made us a little skittish, I think. We get ready for a new year. And I think for many of us, our hopes and dreams for this new year, they have been scaled way back, right? Just because of the last several years of our lives, everything we have hoped to do, everything that we have dreamed about, it's just been almost impossible to accomplish, hasn't it? We've had heartaches and troubles and challenges that leave us really just thinking about the next day or the day after that. And, and sometimes our only hope is, Lord, let there not be as much trouble as there was yesterday. Everybody, anybody feeling that these days? Wonder what it might mean for us this year to recapture really the courage that comes from knowing God is with us. And wherever he leads us, he accompanies us on that journey so that we might accomplish everything he calls us to do. I don't know uh, how much fear Joshua was experiencing in the first chapter of the book that bears his name, Joshua chapter one, but I do know the setting of this story. It's after Moses has died. In fact, that's the first phrase, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. To put it in the stage here, Moses was Israel's leader for more than 40 years. He had led them out of Egypt. He had, with God's help, delivered them from Pharaoh. But then for 40 years, they had wandered around in the wilderness. Talk about not making much progress. Now they stood on the edge of the promised land and right as they're about to go into it, this mighty leader dies. And God turns to the number two man named Joshua 
and says, it's your turn now. Let's read about the story in Joshua chapter 1. Verses 1 through 11. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is aid. My, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where, you're, where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. And no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Lord, we pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love the promise at the end of this passage. God, after saying all of these things to Joshua, says, if you'll do these things, if you'll obey what I'm calling to you, you will be both successful and prosperous. I don't know about you, but my social media walls are filled with internet ads call, uh, inviting me that if I'll just do whatever it is they're selling, I will be successful and prosperous this year. Anybody get those advertisements right now? I mean, I get advertisements on how to not procrastinate. I get advertisements on how to not be lazy and go work out. I get advertisements on how to eat well or how to make a million dollars this year. I mean, over and over again, people are selling us this idea that if we'll just buy what they are selling, we will be successful and prosperous. These two words in this text really probably should be interpreted a little differently than you and I most often think of successful and prosperous. They're Hebrew words that show up in other places in the Old Testament and they, they carry with it not just this idea of monetary success. That's what we so often think of. We think of this will be a successful year if the stock market goes up. This will be a successful year if my business does well. This will be a successful year, maybe we think physically, if I don't get sick. But these words carry with it a, a broader idea of what it means to be prosperous and successful. It carries with it the idea of someone who lives their life in accordance with God's ways. Someone who lives their life uh, according to God's will. They understand that God is sovereign and they, they invest their lives in the things that matter to God so that their whole lives are filled with a kind of wisdom and poise that means no matter what comes their way, their life, even if it's not their bank account, but their life is a life of prosperity and success. When I think about most of my goals for this year, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I mean, really, if you could just say anything at all about what I want out of this year, in my best moments, it's that, that at the end of the year, I want to be a better follower of Jesus than I am today. I want to, you know, Jesus, the scripture in Luke tells us Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I've given up on the stature part, but to grow in wisdom would be a great gift this year. To know that God is doing a work in me that helps me to be the kind of person that he's called me to be. There's no greater success than that. And because you're here on a 10 a.m. service on January 1st, my guess is that in your best moments, that that's something you want as well. But when we want such things, we know that to, to live in such a way calls us to, to live in a way that we must confront some of the most basic fears of our life. To grow in wisdom 
in the ways of God means we will be doing the things that God calls us to do. And let's just be honest, those are risky things. God calls us to love one another. And I don't know if you've ever tried loving another person, another sinful human being, but there's nothing safe about loving each other, is there? I mean, love anyone at all. And there are times that your heart will be broken. There are times that you will experience the pain of rejection. There are times that you will experience the, the, the heartbreak of loss. To love anyone at all is risky. And yet this is God's greatest call on our life, to love one another. Jesus doesn't even stop there, does it? It'd be one thing if he said, hey, love all those nice people there at Sugarland Baptist Church. I mean, let's just be honest. We're, we're, we're pretty good people, but it's still hard to love one another in this place. But God goes even further, doesn't he, on this commandment to love. He says, you're not just supposed to love the good people at Sugarland Baptist Church. You're even supposed to love your enemies. Anybody got an enemy from last night because they just shot those fireworks way too early in the morning? God calls us to love even those people and to love in such a way we know is risky business. It calls us to have courage. Every new year, even, even if we have goals that are smaller than that, goals uh, about what we want to accomplish in our own life, in our own relationships, we know that every one of those goals to be successful, to be prosperous, to actually complete that goal at some point will bring us face to face with fear. Have any relationship with all and you must, any kind of relationship at all and you must face the fear of rejection. Take any kind of new leadership calling in your life here at church or work and you have to face the fear that you may not be enough. Take any chance in this life at all and you have to face the fear that you may not succeed. These are fears we all experience and yet to live a life of, uh, of, of, that, of obedience, to live a life that leads to the prosperity and success that God talks about requires that we face our fears and, be, and live out a life of courage in God's name. I, I don't think uh, it was a new year for Joshua, but it was a new season, wasn't it? As we noted earlier, the text says simply, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. I'm pretty sure you know who Moses is, but in case you don't, the first five books of the Bible are called the books of Moses. He's a pretty big deal uh, in the Bible. In fact, you get to the end of the book of Deuteronomy and it's, it, Moses has died and they're giving their eulogies of him. God's giving the eulogy of Moses and said, there's no one else that's ever lived like my ser servant Moses who saw God face to face. And then it goes a step further and says, and there never will be a another like him. And all the people gathered there said, amen. And then God turns to Joshua and says, okay, Joshua, now that Moses is dead, you are up. Talk about a tough gig. I mean, here it is that even God had given Moses his eulogy and, and had just, you know, gushed and gushed and gushed. And then he turns and says, okay, Joshua, time to see what you got. I don't know if Joshua was experiencing the fear of failure. The text doesn't really tell us. It does help us to know that if Joshua was scared silly, God wasn't. That whether or not there would be another like Moses, God trusted that Joshua could carry the day with his help. And we know this because he gave him the simplest and clearest of commands. He says in verse two to Joshua, Joshua, get ready, get ready. You're up, it's time. Get ready to cross the Jordan River and to the land I'm about to give to them that is the Israelites. And then he gives a second command. It's really just two commands in this whole passage. The first, get ready to cross the river and two, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people. These two commands really convey two simple truths to you and to me today. That no matter what season of our life God, we're in, God is still at work. This was a truth that Joshua had to accept, but it was also a, a truth that the people of God had to accept. They had been fo following Moses for a long, long time. And it was probably tempting for them to think that once Moses had died, that's it. There it goes. Who's going to talk to God for us? I mean, Moses talks to him face to face. What are we going to do now? 
It's tempting when the seasons of our life change, especially from seasons perhaps of blessing to seasons that are more difficult. It's tempting for us to think that, that God isn't going to move in this season in the way he moved in the past. I, I can think about that in times of our life where perhaps as a young adult, you know, you just have all this free time. And, 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 and Alice and I, when we were dating, we were very active in the, the Baptist student ministry there at Texas A&M. We're going to Bible studies like five times a week it felt like, you know, and you're, everybody's excited about following Jesus and we're going and doing summer missions and all of these different things. And then guess what happened? We, we got a little older and we got married and we had kids. And by the time we got them bathed and in bed, we were too tired to do anything except pray, Lord, have mercy on us. We are sinners. Right? And it didn't always feel as spiritual. And it didn't always feel the same way. And it's tempting at times to think as the seasons of life change, that they, they aren't as open to God's working in our lives. But friends, if God can keep working after the death of Moses, if he can look at a man like Joshua and say, your time is now, then it doesn't matter what season of life we find ourselves in today, God's got plans for you. And he's at work in our lives. And he's at work in the world. And it may not look exactly like it looked like yesterday, but that doesn't mean it still can't be good. God is at work no matter the season. And no matter the season, he's inviting us to be a part, which takes courage for you and for me. Because no matter what, if we are going to involve ourselves in God's work, it's going to require courage from our lives. I've used this illustration before, but it's, it's just one that, I, it was a gift from God in my life a long time ago. And, and I, I just have to, it stays on my desk and I have to bring it out every now and then. It's just a reminder to me of why life requires courage. So you've seen this before, some of you. And I know it's hard to see from here. There's a dirty old jar. Uh, Allison's family has some property on Lake Granbury. And one summer there was a drought and the lake had really receded. And, and, and like so many lakes in Texas, it's really a reservoir, which meant there used to be farms where the lake used to be. In fact, Allison's uh, great grandfather's farm was where Lake Granbury used to be. And so we're walking out on the dry lake bed, kind of messing around and, and finding all sorts of old stuff that's interesting. And, and I find in the mud there, this jar that's sticking out about that much. And I dig it up and, and for the first time all day, find an entire jar. Now it's completely filled with mud. And, and so I take it and I begin to wash it out. And there's something in that jar. And I, and I slowly wash it out and, and discover there is a freshwater clam inside this jar. They're all over at Lake Granberry. It's little kids. I, when my kids were little, they would collect them. I started to look at it and I thought, huh, how did that thing get in there? It's, it's so big that it won't come out. I'm going to be careful with it because I don't want to break it but it's too big to come out. And as I looked at this, it dawned on me that at some point in the past, this little clam found its way into this jar and said, man, this is a nice place to be. You know, when there were storms and, and all sorts of things, when big fish swam by, you know, just this was a nice, safe, secure place to be. And it settled in here and got fat and happy and then got trapped. It became a metaphor for really my spiritual life. It's very easy for me because I'm a person who loves comfort. Can I just admit that? I'm a person who loves safety. I'm just one of those people wired that way. I know some of you go jump off mountains for fun. That's not the kind of thing I do, okay? It's not built into my personality. And so it's very easy for me when I find myself in a safe place, perhaps a safe place that God's led us to because sometimes God in his graciousness, he brings us into safe harbors. But guess what? If we are following Jesus, while he may bring us into a safe harbor for a season, he will never keep us there. That there are times where he gives us rest, but it's so that he might renew us to send us back out into the work. Because God's work is this, to redeem a sinful and dying world. And as long as we are part of his work in the world, then what he is going to call us to time and time again is to be, as Jesus put it, as clearly as he could, light in the darkness. And if we're to be light in the darkness, we can't, we can't hide in the jar our whole lives. God's constantly calling us to new steps of faith. So this is what Joshua teaches us, right? That no matter the season of our life, God is still at work. 
And God will call us to participate in that work. And if we are going to participate in that work, it will take courage on our part. Eventually we have to leave the safe places of our life and step into a world in need. Courage, G.K. Chesterton once wrote, is almost a contradiction in terms. It means a strong desire to live, taking the form of a readiness to die. He, see, he quotes Jesus and says, he, he that will lose his life, the same shall save it. He says, it's not just a piece of mysticism for saints and heroes. It's a piece of everyday advice for sailors and mountaineers. It might as well be printed in, a, in an Alpine guide or a drill book. What he meant by that was this. He gives the example of somebody who's, who's rock climbing and they get to a place where they're, they're just, they, 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 they've almost trapped. It's a sheer drop off to the sea in one direction, but, but to keep going, they're going to have to really commit themselves fully to going out upon the precipice and around the bend. He says to do that, that person must have a strong desire to live. It's not that they want to be careless, but they also, they have to be willing to die. They have to take a step out into the void almost in order to make their way. He uses the same example of a soldier who's trapped in a battle, who's surrounded. To do nothing is suicide, but to fight one's way out requires one to not only love life, but also to have really this ability to, to not fear death as one fights one's way out. He says, this is the life of faith for us. That God is calling us to do risky things. And it means we must have a strong desire to live the life that God wants us to live. But we also must have a brave willingness to fail in so many different ways in order to follow God wherever he leads. I think for so many of us, it's the fear of messing up. It's the fear of other people's opinions. I mean, think of what Joshua must have faced. He must have thought, well, what are the people going to think of me? He might have even doubted himself. I'm, I'm not sure I have what it takes. I've been a really good number two, but we've seen over and over again that number twos don't always translate very well into number ones. God, I'm not sure I have, enough, have what it takes. But here's the thing. He had to die to those fears in order to live in the way God wanted him to live. And for you and for me, on the, in all of the different places that God is calling us to go, we're gonna to have to have a strong desire to live the God, life God wants us to live with a willingness to die to the fears that so often paralyze us in our place. Some of you, if you think of what the biggest goal for this year would be, it would be for you to be set free from a sin that has entrapped you. A sin of addiction, a, a sin uh, 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 of, of, of some other kind that you simply can't get away from. And, and you've not told a single soul about that sin. And here's the thing, we're so afraid of what other people will tell us, but one of the truths that bears itself out over and over again is that if we will confess our sins one to another, it's amazing how the power of sin is broken in our lives. I've got a good friend, a friend in ministry that we visit, not every week, but almost every week. And, and he's somebody that I can do that with, that I can say, here's a sin that I'm struggling with and because he's not, he's, I'm not his pastor. You know, he's not that impressed with me. And he, he's not ever shocked by the fact that I'm a sinner. I, you shouldn't be shocked either, but you know, sometimes we put our pastors on pedestals. And, and here's the thing. It's amazing how when I will confess a sin to him, I, I almost uh, immediately struggle less with that sin. Just the naming of it out loud to a fellow follower of Christ takes some of the power of that sin away. But you know what I know this long in my life? It takes a lot of courage to confess our sins to a trusted friend. Even if it's someone we know loves us and cares for us, we're still afraid, it's a lie of the devil, that they won't love us if they really know who we are. Here's what I've discovered when I'm vulnerable in such a way, it almost always invites the other person to be vulnerable in the same way back to me. Because a newsflash, we are all sinners. And all of us have sins to confess, but it takes courage. It takes courage to step out and live in that way. God may be calling some of you, really calls all of us, but maybe you've been hearing us talk about loving where you live and you've had a neighbor that you're cultivating a relationship with and, and, and you're getting to a place where you think, you know, the door is open to share my faith, but, but you know, that takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? 
to step out in faith and, and not just talk about going to church and not just talk about the fact that, that you're a Christian, but to talk about Jesus and what he has done for you. And yet, we can only really fulfill the commandments of Christ. We can only go where he leads if what? We have courage to go to those places where our fear constantly whispers, you should not go. It's interesting that in this passage, the commandment to lead the people across the Jordan only happens one time. But the commandment to be courageous, God repeats it three times. It's God knows how often we, we find ourselves paralyzed by fear. Oh, good news though, courage doesn't just come from us kind of filling up our own gumption. It's not that we just have to ratchet up, you know, the courage to, to jump off the ledge. No, courage, true courage, Christian courage comes from knowing God is with us. God gives Joshua two commandments in this passage, but next to those two commandments, he gives him six promises. In verse two, he promises that he's going to give him the land. In verse three, he says, he expands that promise and says, I'm going to give you everywhere your foot treads. In fact, the Hebrew really puts it this way. I've already given you everywhere your foot is going to tread. They haven't even set foot there yet, but God has already given it to them. In verse three, uh, uh, he's, uh, in verse four, he gives a definition of that territory and says, this, this land is going to extend from the Mediterranean to Lebanon to Lebanon, to the, to, the, to the Euphrates. And then in verse five, he says, no one will ever be able to stand against you. And then the best promises of all five and six, God says, just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And verse six, I will never leave you or forsake you. Two commandments and six promises. Promises that can be summed up really in this way, wherever God leads, he'll go with us. And two, that, that uh, God will never li leave us. That whatever he promises, he will deliver. These promises redefine our fears, don't they? They help us to understand that God isn't inviting us to something easy, but he is inviting us to do something with him. And as long as he's with us, we can have all the courage in the world. I'm not a big guy. I don't get in a lot of fist fights because that wouldn't be a good idea, right? But if I'm gonna go get in one, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna find somebody bigger than me to go with me because I'm gonna need their help. And this is the picture we have in the scriptures that wherever we go, God goes with us. If it's the places he's asked us to go, then we can take courage that he is there beside us and we can count on him. One of my favorite singer songwriters is a guy who was a little ahead of A&M uh, from me years ago named Ross King. Some of you've heard his music. One of his latest albums, he has a song really about his own struggles with anxiety and fear. And in that song, he talks about God's presence and, and, and being with him, even in those dark moments. And I love the, the, the concluding line of the chorus. He says, the things that I'm afraid of are afraid of you. Isn't that a great line? That, that all the things that terrify us, that all the things that cause us anxiety, we probably have good reason to fear some of those things. Those things can be bigger and more threatening uh, than, than we are in life. But we've got good news. There is one who walks beside us that the things we are afraid of are afraid of. Because of that, we can have great courage to go where Christ leads. How do we stay aware of God's presence? How do we remember that he's there? I don't, I don't know about you, but as many times as I have this sitting on my desk, I'm still tempted over and over to crawl back into my safe places, to go back where I think there will be no trouble. That even though I'm a preacher whose job it is every week to stand up and talk about God, I still sometimes forget that he is there, that the courage seems to disappear in my life. In this passage, I think God gives us really the answer when he also in the second time calls Joshua to be strong and courageous. Verse seven, be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left that you might be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips and meditate it on it day and night 
so that you will be careful to do everything written into it. This idea of it being on their lips in the ancient world, people didn't read silently. So he's really saying the same thing twice. He's saying, always have the words of scripture in your mouth and in your mind. Say them out loud to yourself, read them to yourself, meditate on them. Because when we meditate upon the word of God in every aspect of our life, guess what? It's hard to forget that the one who wrote those words is also the one who is with us every day of our lives. And here at Tubman's autobiography, I mean, biography, it tells the story of how, you know, such a, a courageous woman in our histories, uh, in our country's history, she, she escaped as a slave after uh, uh, someone had attempted to murder her. And then she spent her days not in safety, but constantly trying to help others escape slavery on the Underground Railroad. And years later, when she was talking to her biographer, of course, they were wanting to talk about all of the different ways that she did this, but she kept bringing back to the fact that one of the things that empowered her day by day was her meditation upon God's word. She loved Isaiah 16, three for obvious reasons, hide the fugitives and do not betray the rest, refugees but her meditations really ran throughout the scriptures. She talked about that when she would go about her work, wherever she was, she would talk to the Lord. She would turn the scriptures into prayer. As she says, when I, when I would go wash my face and I would take the water in my hands, I would say, oh Lord, wash me and make me clean. When I, when I take the towel and wipe my face and my hands, I would cry, oh Lord, in Jesus' name, wipe away all my sins. When I took up the broom and began to sweep, I groaned, oh Lord, whatever sin there be in my heart, sweep it out, Lord, clear and clean. You think of a woman who faced such challenges, but did so with great courage and boldness. And what was at the root of her life? The word of God, which reminded her of the presence of God, which enabled her to do courageous and risky things in God's name. I don't know what this year holds for us, friends. I'll just be honest. One of my prayers is, Lord, some calmness would be great. But I also know that wherever God leads, he'll go with us and we can trust him to be there. And if I'll meditate upon his word day after day, I'll be less prone to forget that he's near because every time I remember he's near, it helps keep the fears at bay and gives me the courage to obey him in all the ways he asked me to. The same can be true for you. Let's be a people this year who like Joshua, step into the new season in front of us and do so with courage and faith, not because of our own power, but because of the power of the one who calls us and accompanies us along the way. Lord, we give you thanks that you are always with us. And because of that, we can count on you. Lord, we pray that the pre your presence, your promised presence would give us the courage to do what we need to do to obey you this day. It may mean to confess our sins, not just to you, but Lord, to someone we know loves us and we can trust. Because Lord, simply saying it out loud sometimes helps break the power of sin in our lives. Lord, maybe it's sharing our faith or, or, or extending an olive branch to someone we've been in, in a fight with. Lord, there's a thousand different ways that you call us to obey your commandments, but Lord, give us the courage this day to obey those places where we know you've spoken and that doing so, we may be the kind of people that you've called us to be. This is success. This is what it means to prosper. So Lord, Help it be so in our lives today. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. As we come to a time of invitation, you're invited to respond to the Spirit's leading in your life. For some of you, it may mean for the very first time saying, I'm ready to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm ready to confess my sins and be declared a child of God. I'd love to visit with you during this next song about how to do that. Others of you are looking for a church home, a place where you can come and take the risk of being in relationship with other believers each and every week. We'd love to visit with you about what it means to be a part of our church family. And for each of us, it, maybe it's just listening to the Spirit, asking Him where He wants you to go this year, and then praying for the courage to obey that call.
Wherever the Spirit leads, I pray you'd follow. Let's stand and respond to the Lord. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I Amen. Congregation, please be seated. The deacons and the ushers are going to come forward at this time to take up our offering together. As we continue to worship through giving, we would invite you to continue to worship through singing as well. My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less. Sing with us. Then Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging Christ do that within us. Please be seated. We want to make you aware of some announcements of some current happenings in our church and over the next few weeks as well, the things that are happening. Our Sanctuary Choir begins again this Wednesday night at 6.30. So if you are a member of the Sanctuary Choir, our rehearsal begins this Wednesday. For all other Wednesday night activities, those activities begin on the 11th, January the 11th, so not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. Activities for all ages, discipleship groups, and uh, discipleship opportunities will begin on the 11th. Following that, at the end of this month, our teenagers have uh, Disciple Now, which is coming up very soon, sooner than uh, it perhaps feels at this point. If you are not yet signed up, if you're a teenager, you can go ahead and sign up online. And for all of those who have not yet invited a friend to come to Disciple Now, make sure you are thinking about and inviting a friend to come to that as well at the end of the month. You can sign up online for that. 
Next Sunday morning is uh, the beginning of our uh, regular schedule again. So we will have Bible studies at 8.30 and at 11.05. And then our service will be again at 9.45 in the morning as well. So regular service again next Sunday morning. Um, I think there is one more. I'm trying to find my list. No, that is it, actually. That's all we have going on uh, right now. We hope that you will be uh, involved uh, over the next few weeks as things begin to kick off in 2023. If we're all ages, we want you to plug into our church in a strong way um, in this new year and to renew your commitment and renew your involvement in all ways. So we hope that you will be involved in that and will be a part of all of the things that are kicking off over the next couple of weeks. Let's stand together. Pastor, do you have anything else you would like to say. We do have a new member. We'll do that next week, perhaps, so when we have our video. You can see their picture now, but we'll, we'll uh, introduce next week. Uh, anything else you'd like to say? Okay, now let's stand, uh, and we'll uh, be dismissed. Let's pray together through song. Oh, God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Oh, God, you are, you are bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Happy New Year, and you are dismissed. Thank you so much.